I'm Liam Billingham. <laughs> I'm George Fragopoulos. And this, Oeuvre Busters. It says Ooh. this, Oeuvre Busters in the notes. Nice. It doesn't say this is, so we have to we have uh. to strictly adhere. This, Oeuvre Busters. Hello, this, Oeuvre Busters. We're like those moronic. 80s? I mean, 80? you would know better than me. I think Satan Tango's... No, no it's, it's in the a 90s. Post- 95, yeah. yeah 94. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Bella. I love yeah, you. Because it's, it's definitely post-fall of the USSR. Yep, I know. I saw Street Fighter. Um, How many times you saw Street Fighter? How many times do <laughs> you? Is... I saw Rambo Three, dedicated to the brave Mut Hajin. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I, didn't they change that? That scroll, I think at some point. I fucking hope not. That's a piece of film history. It's it's a, <laughs> it's, in, it's in the um, it's in the National Archives. There, I now one, I'm of, think... one of my dad's great bits, may he rest in peace, was anytime Richard Crenna showed up in a movie, he'd be like, fuck Richard Crenna. This guy's like a very 80s complaint. Like, <laughs> this guy sucks at acting. Is Richard Crenna the guy that plays the, like the sergeant who gets captured? Yeah, the colonel. But my dad, yeah. like literally, we'd be like watching Rambo and he'd be like, oh, turn it off. I can't. Like, I can't watch John, Richard Crenna. We need you. Doesn't that like what he says like in all the movies? Like yeah. John. He's a, he was a genuinely bad actor. Now I'm thinking that the first Uber Busters performance piece should be like a side by side. We should do like 24 hour Satan Tango and 24 hour Anchorman. We call it like Satan Anchorman, Tango Man, Tango Man, Tango Man, Tango Man's good, and, and Tango Man's good. And they're but there's not enough Bellatar in that. <laughs> and they're both at some sort of way linked together, and they're playing Let's side by side. Let's talk about it offline. Is everyone really into this? I think Speaking they of are, into yeah. this, let's go into. <gasps> the lower depths. What a what I love about you is your transitions are so subtle, <laughs> and not at all forced. <laughs> so yeah, Liam, we're talking about 1957's The Lower Depths, of course, directed, directed by, by Akira Kurosawa, the one and only, and starring our boy Toshiro Mifune. And then a whole host of of uh, what I would call great unsung heroes of the Kurosawa oeuvre. Um, George, what happens in the lower depths? God, what happens in the lower depths? It's what really, happens in life, you know? I mean, pretty much, actually. Actually, So, lower depths based on, as I think I just already said, the Maxim Gorky play from 1902, I believe. Jesus, you um, said that. You said I, it. Uh, sorry, sorry. At least Why I got the I year right. Up? You said William. it. Sorry. Um, I, love it, I love you too. It takes place during the Edo period in Japan. There's real. There's no real plot. The story is a bun- about a bunch of misfits and outcasts who are renting out a hovel, a house, a tenement um, from a greedy landlord and his wife. Uh, Toshiro Mifune plays... And Liam, can you help me with this name here? Is it Sudakichi? Is that how you Sudakichi. pronounce it? Sudakichi. Would be, uh, my, ge- would be my, my, my guess. I would say, I would say it's Sudakichi. So his, I'll always hit that first syllable is what his, I've always understood. To be his, how you say it. his story is kind of the... Runs through the entire film. Um, so he plays a thief who's romantically involved with the landlady, Osugi. He eventually begins to fall for the younger sister, Okao- Okayo, and eventually murders Osugi's husband um, by accident. Um, and b- the rest of the film is really kind of tapestry of minor stories and subplots. So, for example, there's a story of an actor who's a drunk and who can no longer remember his lines. There's this wisely old, old man who appears out of nowhere and rents um, out like a bed in the hovel and he, who seems to have like a mysterious past, but he's also kind of this person who gives like sagely advice to everybody. There's this old tinker with a, a dying wife who gets ill and eventually dies about halfway through the film. And the film is just kind of like this incredible tapestry of all of these different stories and how they kind of revolve around, um, again, this kind of place that they've all have crashed in for whatever reason. Um, but they're all like down on their luck. And the film ends in a kind of incredible sequence during a rainstorm um, where some of the members of the shack begin to dance and just kind of like begin to celebrate their terrible terrible existence um only to have their fun interrupted by news that the actor um has committed suicide and i would actually say that the final like five minutes of this film are probably the most amazing parts of this film at least for me personally yes and also speaking of bellatar have a tarian kind of uh exploration of the idea of music and art uh performed by like the people in dire straits as a way to escape the 
miserable existence that they are stuck in. It feels sure. like the dance sequence in Satan Tango. Though Although in I, Satan Tango, it goes on for like 11 minutes. I would say you missed opportunity on your part to say Tarian instead of Bellissimo. Huh? Huh? Because I mean, Did I you mention, did we mention that this is based on a Maxim Gorky, Gorky play? Of I the think same we name did mention that it was based on a Maxim Gorky play. Well, did we mention that it was directed by, uh, protected and produced, did we mention that it was directed, produced, and written by Akira Kurosawa, also written by Hideo Ogune? Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but it's based on The Lower Depths by Mal- Maxim Gorky. Oh. Uh, the music is by Masaru Sato. The cinematography was Kazu Yamazaki. And the film was uh, was released in Japan on the 17th of September, 1957, having finished principal photography in July of that year. Whoa. So this thing came out quick um and it was produced by toho um and the uh the film was quite despite its uh, modest scope was quite expensive because they built that entire set and actually um they hid cameras throughout uh the set and you obviously can't see them in the film but there are moments when like they're shooting one side of this i don't know how you describe it this like hovel that they it's live a hovel, in hovel, yeah and um there's there, there, tech, there are no <laughs> visible cameras but it feels as though there could be it's funny though too because I was watching this and I was like, "Oh, that hot, you know, you get a little bit of natural sunlight. It's kind of breezy. It's spacious, high ceilings. Like that hovel in Brooklyn would still probably run you two grand easy." I was that like, "That is I, not a that's not a cheap hovel." And you um, <laughs> and your and your broker would be like, "This is a great deal." Son what of what would the neighborhood be? That's like, what would they change the neighborhood name to be? It'd be something. Ooh, that'd be um, Gorky Heights. Gork. Gorky, Gorky Park Heights. Gorky, Gorky Park, Park Gorky Heights. Gorky Park Heights. Yeah. Thank and you the very par- much. And the park is two and a half miles away. <laughs> this is what happens when we barely write a script for the episode. <laughs> George, what did you think of this film? So, Liam, because this is part of the this is one of the only parts of the script we did work on. I to say I enjoyed this film would be, I think, a bit of an overstatement i'm really glad i saw it there are moments of it that are really powerful like the equivalent of saying you knew all your lines to an actor that wasn't a bad play like you really said them all and i understood them i really am glad i saw this you really yeah i liked seeing this film you memorized them um congratulations i'm I'm hey hey i'm proud of you who knew that your one-man show could be three hours (laughs) i'm i'm glad i saw it um it was it was a bit it was a bit of a hard watching an it's endurance very, test yeah it's very slow again there's no real plot nothing really happens um it's hard to describe because there are so many subplots um working through the story the last five minutes again are kind of transcendent and i will say this though unlike a lot of other kurosawa films there's a lot of humor in this film it's a lot of dark humor but i was actually surprised at how often i found myself not mm. like not laughing out loud, but like at least kind of like chuckling. Like, so, for example, the actor at the very, very beginning at some point tries to like s- say this in- like soliloquy or something from some sort of play and he can't remember his lines and it's delivered with some humor. Oh, yeah. That's very, very um, powerful moment in the film, yeah. I think, actually, yeah. when he finally remembers his lines. And when he finally remembers them later on. And there's yeah. another funny moment later when they kind of run into the landlord's quarters and they start being the crap out of them. And the one that guy like that sequence is incredible. That sequence the fight is incredible. Is incredible. And yeah. the one guy like punches him in the head, and then like reaches over and grabs like like a, a piece of bread or something from the shelf and starts eating it. Like it's, it's a, done really yeah, really it's subtly a dumpling and really well. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's like a yeah, it's it's really funny. So there's also some humor in this. Liam, what did you think of this powerful film? I tend I watched this film over two nights. Um, I think I expected it to be a bit of a slog. And I think it should be said that like these movies, that's not, I don't think the viewing experience is a reflection of the movie at all. I think that this film would play as the same thing when we we were recently on um, the only podcast about movies talking about Citizen Kane, which is a movie that I admire, but I was bored watching it at home on a TV screen um, because I, it's very easy to be distracted by life. And I think that, when I was actually thinking about this, George, when we started this season, plan this season, I don't, th- I don't think we maybe no, maybe we did know we would be in quarantine, or we didn't know how long it was going to last, obviously, but I don't think we sort of thought through <laughs> what's it going to be like to watch twenty something black and white films from the forties, fifties, sixties, 
uh, that are all subtitled and all mostly over two hours long. Um, not that I would do it differently, but it's a, it's a unique kind of challenge that we hadn't faced in the past few seasons. Um, I admire this movie. There's things that I love about it. And I think there's some really interesting things to talk about that are almost meta textual mm-hmm. that I would like to talk about, especially in terms of uh, Kurosawa's career. I think it's an interesting like movie movie as a reflection point of his career that we can talk, that we can get into. Um, I think we should start by saying that, uh, I don't know if we've said this before, but this is based on a Maxim Gorky play from 1902. Yeah, it's... uh, Maxim Gorky, you you say, huh? Are you familiar with the play? No, but it's funny because I live in Gorky Heights, or I used to live in Gorky Heights in Brooklyn. The rent there, everything's changed. (laughs) Everything's changed. It's gentrified a bit, yeah. Well, it's weird. It's now Putin Square, so it's really weird. (laughs) Ouch. Ouch. Actually, apparently Stalin might have um, murked Gorky, or if not murked him, at the very least made his life a living hell towards the end. Well, I think a lot of people were murked by that particular that particular a f- a group. Few. Of, a few people were murked. <laughs> um, I read the play in college. I have no memory uh-huh. of it. Um, I have not seen... I have a copy of it that um, I, bor- I borrowed from my father-in-law. Um, and I, I did not get a chance to read it, and I have not seen the Jean... Jean um, the Renoir film, um, but it is on Criterion, and I thought about watching it. I actually thought about watching it in preparation for this, but two things prevented me. One was time, uh, which, you know, we all have so little of because we're going to die. And the second thing was the fact that we're not, we're not, we're not like watching the film in relationship to genre, genre, so, so I decided to skip it. (laughs) I decided to skip it. Um, but, I almost wish I didn't know that this was based on a play because I think that affected my experience of watching it. And then I spent the entire time being like, Jesus Christ, what a fucking play this is. And to Kurosawa's credit, I don't think he hides from that. I think the decision to rehearse for weeks meant that they shot the film really quickly. Everyone rehearsed Mm -hmm. in character. They hid cameras around the set. He wanted to, as I understand it, create as theatrical a kind of staging as possible for this film um did the theater did, so as a result you're you're watching things we've talked about from earlier in the season like people think and make decisions and interact and there's a lot of like the movie almost to me works it's the best in a wide when it's in the wide and we're seeing numerous characters mm-hmm. as opposed to a lot of the close-up stuff um it's a good movie it's it's a tough watch the other thing that makes it kind of tough is that these yeah i mean these people are living terrible existences and you really feel it and i think that's also a testament to how powerful the film is and how powerful the performances are too mm-hmm. this is also like one of the i think one of the only kurosawa films where at least in translation there's a whole bunch of cursing people are calling each other assholes yes and like the yes like yeah right. so there's yeah. like a lot of like harsh language being tossed around and there's a there's an incredible amount of like harshness in a variety of different ways that comes across in the film, which is another thing that makes it like tough to like sit through. I mean, it does have a Beckettian quality, right? I think that that's mm-hmm. like, I think that like Max Gorky, although the piece, it's a social realism. The, the play is a, is a, well, we haven't said this before, but the play is, the movie is based on a Maxim Gorky play, uh, Maxim which Gorky, is a hallmark of social realism, but is also the play that made Constantine, Constantine Stanislavski, the sort of famous Russian method, uh, director and acting teacher um, sort of made him famous. It was his first like really significant production as I understand it. Um, but it has that quality of being people in a room with le- leading terrible lives to some extent complaining about those lives or speaking about their aspirations and being delusional and um, all of these different things. It has a little bit in common with a uh, Eugene O'Neill play, Eugene O'Neill being like a, a obviously, obviously, obviously. Uh, inspired by Gorky. Like he knew his work and, and mm. was interested in Gorky. And you can see that in a lot of, you can see it in the Iceman Cometh. You can see it in Long Day's Journey into Night. Um, characters who are dissatisfied with their situation in life. And that's like a very... Th- that's everything, but theater puts people in a room and has them talk about that for two hours. Yeah. And that's a little bit what this is. Yeah, for sure. That question. 
Yeah. The all end. right, cool. That's it. Thank yeah, you very right, much, everybody. Kind of up. Well, it's funny you should also kind of say that thing about like kind of their aspirations too, because at the very end, and obviously we could talk about it a little bit more detail later, but that they when they start doing this like really kind of bizarre dance of theirs, um, at, at some point I love the, that dance. The, yeah, they all start chanting. What is it like? Let like the heavens rain pennies on us or something? Yeah, like let the heavens rain penny on us. Yeah. Pen, rain pennies on us. So it's like this again. Obviously, this like moment of. Really, like, kind of, I mean, grotesque might be too strong of a word, but sur- um, surreal, kind of, like, um, dark, certainly dark, as kind of, like, a lot of the dancing is in Bellatar's films, right? Because so much of the movie is really just people talking, there are these two, like, interludes that are dance sequences where the same thing kind of repeats, and it's, it is very weird, but also because it has so much energy. I wouldn't say this is like a high energy movie. There are high energy characters in it, but uh, for me, the movie didn't really kick in until the end of the first scene is like the first act of a play in that there's a lot of table setting in terms of the relationships between the characters. And we meet Sutakichi played by Toshiro Mifune. And then in the second, uh, when the, when the conflict kind of starts to emerge between the love triangle between Osugi uh, the landlady, her sister, Okayo, and Mufune's character is when the movie really starts to take off. And there are like, I think three really big moments that my three favorite moments in the film are the fight when Osugi attacks Okayo and all of their, their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? All of their, uh, the tenants, um, like the tenants. Like, thank yeah. you. I don't know why I forgot the word tenants. <laughs> the tenants, uh, sort of become involved with the fight. And it's this like bravura sequence. It's so well staged and you don't, and then it culminates with the accidental murder of Rokabuye, the, the landlord, by Sutakichi. Um, and that's a really incredible sequence. The ending is a really incredible sequence when they're all dancing and then they find out that um, Danjiro, the actor um, who played, who uh, d- commits suicide. And then the, the third one is a much quieter moment, which is the moment when Osen, the prostitute, is telling the story about the one man she loved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tonosama is standing outside of the, like, standing next to her, and they're sort of commenting on it, and it's this wide shot. And I felt that those were the most successful moments of... I feel like a lot of this movie passed over me. I was kind of like, okay. But that... There's a couple little things that happen in that scene. So there's the character... Um, and I really want to talk about... Uh, Yacht Kaye, the pilgrim, mm-hmm. Kaye, yeah, yeah, yeah. who is Yoki in Seven Samurai, which we should talk about a little bit. But he has a line in that scene, in in the scene where o- um, Osen is talking about her love, her lost love, and he says something like, "Put yourself in her shoes as she tells the story." Yeah. And to me, that felt like a pivotal thing to understand what Kurosawa was doing with this movie a little bit. And it also got me thinking, sorry to, I just, uh, this thought occurred to me at the same time and I'd like to put it to you. Do you feel like this movie has a lot in common with The Idiot? Hmm. In that The Idiot is about cynical, angry people partially affected by a love triangle and a character who comes to town who, who reveals to them the things that they want and they don't know that they want. Whereas in this film... Kaye, the pilgrim, comes to town and is like, hey, let's treat everybody better. Like, let's let the dying old woman, like, say what she needs to say. Like, let's let Tonosama, the ex, the, the ex-samurai, think he's, like, a noble figure. Let's let Osen talk about her lost love, even if the name keeps changing. Like, he sort of acts as a wish fulfillment, as a character that's there to make everybody feel better in the mm-hmm. hopes that by feeling better, they will achieve whatever it is they don't have. So I didn't think about it before in that way, but I think you're right. But I think you're also right because the idiot is a Christ-like figure and this character Mm -hmm. also is like a Christ-like figure in that they both show up, like you just said, right? They both show up to kind of like show the contradictions at play or at the very least to kind of show, let's say, what's at stake. Because also later on after he disappears, there's this one line where... I believe it's Osen says something like, oh yeah, he came to promise us like a better world yes. or something and now he's gone. And that to me was like, oh, that's like kind of like almost like a, a Christian or Christ-like allegory, right? Of like so obviously somebody who appears says like there's a better world to come and then disappears and it's like up, up to us to kind of like figure it out. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you're onto something in that sense that there's this kind of... 
um, that the idiot and this old wise man share similarities for sure. It's also perhaps, I mean, again, like obviously more prevalent, I would say. I mean, I don't know a lot of Gorky's plays. Do you know that this was based on the Maxim Gorky play, by the way, from 1902, The Lower Depths? Hang on. Let me check my notes. <laughs> Oh, George, uh, I just found out that this is based on a Maxim Gorky play of uh, of the same name from 1902. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Um, so, I mean, I think obviously the Christian stuff is way more present in Dostoevsky. I would be interested in maybe doing a little bit of research and maybe writing like a monograph or two on whether her, on the Christian influence in Gorky's mm-hmm. works as well. Maybe you could have done that before we recorded this up. Let's yeah. pause for you so, to do that. Yeah, let right? me put down this mic for a second, and I'll um, get back to you in I'll about do, three I'll years. I'll sing the Jeopardy theme. <laughs> oh, I co- rip Alex Trebek. I come back, and you're just a skeleton. Then rip Liam also. I'm like, Liam! Liam! No! no! I waited too long! <laughs> I, have, I have like a Rip Van Winkle beard, but I have written the three books. I'm like, You're like oh the world's foremost Maxim Gorky scholar. I know and that's Russian. applicable because this film is actually based on a Maxim Gorky play. Oh, you don't say. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Did I tell you I used to live in Gorky Heights? And I'd be like, I didn't tell him to not eat or drink water. Why? Why did Liam die, my poor boy? <laughs> there was end. time now. That was yeah. time now. <laughs> um, Thank you for coming to a performance of the Uber Brusses performance <laughs> we, we hope you've enjoyed our performance <laughs> of, of a podcast based upon maxim gorky's play the lower depths the lower from depths. the year of 1902 yes um but i don't necessarily i think the christian thing is is very clear in the dostoevsky and in fact intentional i wonder if Ma- maxim what are you doing over there what's that noise sorry jesus christ um Maxim Gorky, whose play *The Lower Depths* inspired this film, um, I wish it was the was counter. like was 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 sort of uh, like, as I understand it, a Marxist. Oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you? I don't. Well, uh, well I what mean, do I, you? From your point of view, do you feel like, as someone that knows more about that stuff than I do, do you see that? Pre- do you see the politics of that? Of uh, do you see politics present in this film, and in what way? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that I felt like was lacking in terms of this film's politics was that it's so focused on the individuals. Like the only, and it's it's obviously the only real tangible structural thing that this film points to in terms of why these people are are in the shitty situations that they are is the landlords. And obviously that's right. in of itself like, a powerful structure to point to and to kind of, you know, to vilify obviously that system. But one of the things that kind of, I maybe annoyed it is too strong of a word, but one of the things that I felt like was lacking in this film was like a little bit of a much larger perspective about what is going on in the society. And I don't mean like that I needed a 20 minute introduction to Edo Japan to kind of explain like, well, this is why this character's in the shithole he is in. And this is why this character's like in a mm-hmm. shitty situation. But that there's no, it's so focused on them that there's no sense of a, of a much larger societal structure. And also, and I think this is obviously also like, I think an indictment to some degree on these characters, that there are very few moments of solidarity. Mm. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of like, they're at each other's throats. People die and then people are like, meh. And I get why they're like that because their lives are so terrible. But there's there well, there are very few moments where they're like, oh, wait, we're all kind of in this together in a very tangible mm, way. So from a certain point of view, it's like they're not. So that's interesting because then then it begs the question is like, is what are what what Gorky thinks of these sort of like characters caught up in the lower depths, so to speak? Like, are they able to see solidarity among each other, or is that because of the quote unquote like way that they're quote unquote? I don't have to quote unquote. I didn't say anything in the way that they're. You're living, also doing like a palm thing. There, yeah, I've got a lot of, of stuff like going fingers, on. Like, I'm dancing, like, George. I'm you're dancing. Like, you're clamping down on those words. Do you? I wonder if. So one thing, there is an ideological struggle, struggle though, that plays sure. out in the film, which is, I think, between Kahe, the pilgrim, and Yoshi Saburo, the gambler, mm-hmm. who has the final line in the film. Kahe what a great line, too. seems to be of the mind set that like people need to um, 
let's call him let's call him somewhat of a of a of an optimist in the most loosest interpretation of the world in that like if someone comes before you and is talking about their lost love we need to like grant them the time and the and the, and the way to to speak and we need to like give people space because it will maybe help them maybe this is therapeutic in some way will help them sort of transcend the limits of of how their of how their mind works whereas i would describe yoshi shiburo the gambler who's phenomenal in this movie i think it's mm-hmm. an incredible performance as much more of a cynic and much more like eh nothing really matters like and also very very uh a character of the moment. I think it's significant that he's a gambler in that he's not really about like, he doesn't really care if he wins or gets ahead, but he likes to be present in the moment. And we can talk about how he has the, the fact that he has the, the final line in the film. So he's sort of a cynic in the sense that he's like, eh, I'm kind of all about myself. I'm all about kind of living in the moment. Whereas I think the pilgrim Kahe seems to be about like optimism looking towards the future with hope and 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 uh, and possibility and the fact that the pilgrim disappears in the final 30 minutes of the movie and the film kind of the gambler kind of takes his place in that narrative may say something about kurosawa's ideology about people or feelings oh, about people yeah no he has like a very cynical outlook for sure i mean there are like those moments see i mean i think, I think the great thing also about kurosawa is that he's not unwilling to gesture towards things like kindness or let's say belief or possibilities of of moments of transcendence but yeah for the most part he's really cynical about human nature he's not an optimist by any means no absolutely not um but i think what what is interesting about him is that it's you know, in the in the reading that you can do is that he's clearly sympathetic towards workers movements towards you know I mean I think seven I think the great revelation rewatching seven samurai is how much it has to say about class solidarity that I didn't know it's classist it's classist the what, action somebody say it was classist? the action sequences suck oh, we're not yeah. talking about the fucking guy on the internet <laughs> fuck that guy that's all I'm gonna is fuck that because it's, it's it's so stupid it's I'm like I'm Sorry, so I'm done with Twitter. <laughs> done with it. Find me at got, Liam G. Billingham on Twitter. Um, I, just, I just got I just got a new phone and I've yet to install the app on it. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> like for what kind of for, phones you get? For a few moments, I am free. Uh, it's a Google Pixel. God damn it! I didn't want. Why now? I can't send you iMessages again. That's I this, like to know when they're episode, delivered. This episode of Busters is brought to you by Google Pixel. Google Pixel. Um, get pixelated now. Uh. But at the same time, seem to have a streak of like thinking about individual, ultimately being minded of the idea of individual responsibility. That isn't to say he was like a pull yourself up by the bootstraps person, but I think he believed in the individual's ability to like transcend their situation in order to create like a more cohesive society. Mm -hmm. In, for example, when we think about the character of Mufune, whose name escapes me, Kukichio in Seven Samurai, getting over his sort of like hero worship or his kind of like, in order to become part of all, he sacrifices himself for the society. I think that there's like a, a tension in that. And I think there's a little bit of that in this film between the Pilgrim's sort of selflessness, who he stays with the, 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 the um, I'm sorry, the Tomokichi's wife, Tomokichi being the tinker, while she dies and everyone else dies, is like, yeah. I'm going to go get drunk. And he's like but, selfless. Whereas the gambler's like, eh, she's dead. So what? What's really interesting though about him is that he's what? He's like, in, he's only in half of the film. He's gone for more than also like the last half hour. Cause the last half hour has those two sequences where again, the landlord is killed by Mifune and that's like a 10 or 15 minute sequence. And then the last sequence, which is again at like 10 or 15 minutes. So he's no, not... he's in the, he's in that seat. He disappears in the middle oh, of the fight. Oh, he disappears in the middle he of the like fight. He like literally yeah, runs right. away. And it's yeah, so, yeah. it's because so Because he might stark. have something he's in his just, past. He's just gone. Yeah. Yeah, he might You're have, right, that's yeah, right. Yeah. He might have something in his past. So we don't know but much yeah, about him. Yeah, there's a little bit of like a, of a, of a, of a ideological dialectic. Dialectic. Ding. going on between bing we did it we did it all right we can stop podcasting cut Thirty-one fifteen. got it are you still here um can we talk about the cast because we haven't listed the cast yet but it was very it was we very haven't intentional oh no we haven't yeah because because you also yeah. said that it's like a um a who's who of second half kurosawa 
and I don't like to say that because some of these people are astonishing performers. But yeah. so we have in the film, and we haven't talked about him very much, Toshiro Mifune as Tutakichi, who appears in every, basically every movie we're talking about this season, except for a few. Izuzu Yamada, who plays Osuge, the landlady, who we just recently saw in Throne of Blood as oh, the wife. Right. Yes. Uh, shout out to that episode with our buddy Isaac Butler, Throne of Butler. Um, Kyoko Ka- Kagawa, who plays Okayo, the sister to Osuge, who sort of becomes, as our friend Stuart Galbraith, shout out to him, um, put in his book, becomes the most prominent female lead in Kurosawa's career. She's in films mm-hmm. like Bad Sleep Well, My Favorite High and Low. She really becomes a part of the sort of like troupe. Um, Ganjiro Nakamura plays Orokube, the, the husband. Koji Mitsui plays the gambler. There, I think that Koji Mitsui shows up in some other Kurosawa films, but always in smaller roles. I think this is his most prominent role. He is in High and Low. Um, the next person is Kamatari Fujiwara, who plays Danjiro, the actor, mm-hmm. who has a role in Ikiru, but you'll probably remember most prominently from Seven Samurai. He's Manzo, the man who hides his daughter Uh, or has his daughter uh, and he was like a very famous comic actor and this by far he looks nothing like he looked in um seven samurai but it's the same actor um minoru chiaki plays tonosama the the sort of ex-lord samurai character who is mm in he's hihachi in seven samurai he's in i live in fear he's in stray dog yeah he's great he's probably the third most prominent kurosawa figure in terms of repetition and, and films we've seen him in um Akimi Nagishi plays Osen, the prostitute. She was the youngest mother in I Live in Fear, if I recall correctly. And Iko Miyoshi plays Asa, the wife who dies. And she's in every Kurosawa movie. She's always the mom. She's Mifune's Mm. first wife in I Live in Fear. And so he made this movie where he took all of these figures who are sort of like, there's no Takashi Shimura in this movie. He took all these figures that I think are significant in his films, but never in, in, in the most prominent positions and made them kind of all shine in this movie except of course for poor Iko Miyoshi who dies and spends most of the film off camera hacking up but I think the most prominent character that one we haven't talked about is Boku uh, we've talked about him but we haven't talked about Bokuzen Hidari who plays Kahe the Pilgrim who is mm-hmm. in basically every Kurosawa movie um, and most famously plays Yoki the character who Mufune gives a, such a hard time to in Seven Samurai. He's the guy that he's always like, you know, pushing to do more and more and more. Yeah. And I think it's interesting in this film, he plays sort of like the character, the calm, cool character that everybody listens to. Mm-hmm. And it's a total inverse of what we've seen him do. And I just think it's apparently from what I've read, the character that he plays in this film is much closer to who he was as a person. Like there was almost no mm. difference. And so to me, it's interesting, like, from a metatextual perspective, the idea that Kurosawa was like, I want to make a movie without, well, not without, but that leans less heavily on two to three characters and make a film that covers a whole range of people, but gives special attention to this older actor who, like, has kind of played buffoons or cowards or uh, lesser roles and make him sort of the, the, like, mouthpiece for what I think the film is ultimately dealing with and make him kind of the most like not sympathetic, but by far the most like the grounding of the movie. He kind of grounds the movie and makes it bearable. Well, what's interesting also about Mifune's character is that he's not really, I mean, in terms of screen time, he's like, what, like, what would you say? Like 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Like he's not on the screen as much as you think. Like he really is an ensemble cast. And I think to that point, he, He's incredible when he's on screen. I think Donald Ritchie said that this was his favorite Mifune performance, which mm. is really, really interesting. Um, and he co- is sort of like he'd he'd reached that point of like you forget it's Mifune and it becomes all about his his technique. Um, it, it, I'm sorry, it becomes not about his technique, but like he he totally becomes the character. Like I didn't spend a lot of time being like, oh, there's Mifune. I felt very like. I felt very like th- I'm watching a character in a way. Does that make sense? Like it, it felt maybe because he's less prominent in the film. Yeah. Well, I thought we were gonna, I thought we were trying to get to also is that this is almost like um, not meta textual, but like meta. It's meta in the sense that like Kurosawa was going out of his way to in some sort of way, um, 
get his actors to play versions of themselves with like as little mm. let's say distance between themselves and the characters that they were playing and that also kind of like makes it somewhat meta like so that's what i thought you were trying to say by like oh like he gets that one character that one actor who's like closest to playing himself i'm not saying that this that's what um how you were saying. dare like, you put fucking words, words. <laughs> no what i I'll do understand do about it. mifune though um having never met the man <laughs> sadly sadly would have been great um, we I don't know what we would have said to each other is that he was like a very you know orderly he said, he said to Liam get the fuck out of my way it's like yes <laughs> sir like, and then he would have said did you know that the film The Lower Depths that I was in was based on a Maxim Gorky play of the same name actually um, Mr. Mifune did not know that please tell me a little bit more he was from what I understand a very orderly person his son described him in his story as being the kind of guy that would like line up his cigarette butts in the ashtray he didn't just put them in he like kept them clean and he was very kind of quiet and um cool dude uh except when he was drinking which as i understand it was a lot a big <sighs> drinker uh-huh. um but yeah i think i don't think the movie i think mifune plays a prominent role in the film and you're aware when he's there but it is not a mifune showcase he For kind sure. of disappears into the ensemble yeah he definitely does mm-hmm. um I think this is a this is a good flick, man. I like it. I just no, it was I, a hard I, I watch like, to watch at home. It's a hard watch, yeah. I mean, yes, it just it is. It's a hard watch. I I also have to, I watched it not over two. I watched it over like a day and a half. I started it last night. I saw the first like hour, and then this morning I saw the last hour like in two different sittings. Um, I would definitely um, recommend it for sure. It is Kurosawa. It's like advanced level Kurosawa. Like it's not a place to start. Um. But it Without is definitely question. a movie that I think would be incredibly rich to see on the big screen. It's a, can I ask, so why, I mean, and obviously there's a lot of answers to this question, but like why would somebody like Kurosawa, like you get, you get, you have this material, you make it so much like a play. You don't do something like what Lars von Trier does in Dogville, right? You don't make it so meta that it becomes a kind of commentary, not just on theater, but also on film. Why not just fucking direct like a play? Why not well, just do theater? I think we should probably remember um, that. And I, I don't mean this belittlingly. I think that like we're, we're talking about an industry that produced an astonishing amount of content. And I think, you know, samurai movies in Japan in the 50s and 60s was, I hate making this analogy, but it's the easiest, is a little bit like superhero shit now, where they just made a lot of them, I, I more than they make the superhero stuff, obviously, because people aren't going to the movies at the same rate and stuff like that. But um, I think he wanted to make movies. And I think that in fairness to him, I don't know that a Dogville-esque, though I suppose, what's his name did it with Hamlet? What's his name? What's his name? Only the most important Shakespearean actor, Lawrence Olivier, what's his name, <laughs> did a sort of staged version of Hamlet a few years later using like a video video film hybrid model. He's a filmmaker, you know? I think that like, it's how he made his living. It's what he did. And I think that that just is, I, I guess I just at this point, it's like I would the idea of Mufu- of Kurosawa being like, I'm going to go direct to play now, not outside the realm of possibility, but like also it's not that it doesn't work as a film, but it doesn't employ the characteristic language of cinema that we all such mm-hmm. and so expect. Can I actually read to your point? Can I read a passage from Stuart Galbraith's no. book? Uh, no, no, oh. no. And then we'll wrap it up. No. Um, <clears throat> Reading hello is boys stupid. and girls. Hello, boys and girls. It's Are Liam. you going to read to us from uh, Maxim Gorky's Lower Depths? Um, all right. So this is talking about the end of the film. Uh, in a brilliant bit of cutting, at the height of the tenant's joyous singing, meticulously rehearsed, though it plays as if it were improvised, word comes that the actor is dead. The gambler, gambler petulantly comments while looking straight into the camera, the idiot, uh, just as... Just a, looks straight into the camera the idiot just as the fun was beginning there is an abrupt cut to black accompanied by a single piercing snap of a hiyoshige the wooden clapper used at the beginning and end of traditional japanese stage performance performances followed by the a purposefully brief owari the kanji character for the end the sudden finale all completed within a few seconds is always shockingly always devastating when viewed yeah so 
Let me just put my bookmark in the book. Um, I think the... If I can project a little bit, I would imagine that movies did not look like this. No, that's not true. I think the deliberateness of the theatricality of this is what makes it an interesting movie. And I think the decision to use the hyoshige, the piercing sound, and the text, mm-hmm. like it, it, it's a it's a very very interesting cinema theater hybrid. And I think that he's one of the few directors that like. Another thing that he's incredible at, besides making the most important action, like the you know, most amazing crime films, most amazing is amazing action films, is he was like, how can I combine theater and film in a way that works? Pretty amazing. Yeah. And that's the thing. Ultimately, he's like a visual storyteller who is able to, in films like Throne of Blood, make an incredibly visual adaptation of, of Macbeth. And here, I think he just rests on, I think he's into the language. I think he loves Russian lit. Oh yeah, no, no question. Yeah, he loves the lit. Russian lit. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a good question. I, 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 that would be my. I just think it's an interesting hybrid. But there, that moment at the end is very specifically like a theater moment put on film. Yeah, I love it when characters look at the camera. Oh, and that happens. Yeah, and, and I think it's the only moment when it happens at the end of the film. It happens mm-hmm, twice mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. And, well, he does film. it. He does it deliberately and well. You know, like yeah, he sort yeah, of, of a, uses that Brechtian alienation thing in that moment quite clearly um yeah i guess i guess my whole th- and, and again I, I totally see your points and I, I think you're right but i think my point is is like oh it could have been pushed a little bit more i think to the extreme right like again like you like those moments where again the characters look mm. directly into the camera like maybe a few more of those moments would have done a better job of signaling the more kind of intention behind making it feel so much like a play yeah though very rarely in the theater do people actually look at the audience unless sure. i mean we're yeah yeah, yeah. When we're talking about like a shakespeare or soliloquy so soliloquy soliloquy or like a brechtian uh jest or uh something no, along those course. lines yeah but, but, the, but i see again, your point but that, that that's like let's say the the best analogy or, or a way mm-hmm. to kind of make apparent the again, the breaking of the fourth wall or, or the way in which, let's say, obviously in theater, you're like, holy shit, like those people are right there. They're like 20 feet away from me. They're they're alive. They're doing their mm-hmm. thing. And Remember that? Happen, Remember, Remember when you up. could see that? Remember I, when that was a thing? So in the pre, in the old days. In the old times. In the yeah. upper depths, not the lower depths. Before the darkness um, came and swallowed us I all. Will, I will also say not to be uh, super obnoxious. Be super but, obnoxious. Go ahead. Um without him doing this we wouldn't have a movie of it so like i don't know i i, I think i think it like I, I just think that like it's it's an it it has nothing to do with intention but like you know uh it's i'm glad it exists and i'm glad it's, yeah. it's, it's as close to a play as as a movie can kind of be this is the second japanese version of it too Mm-hmm. there was one in, in the um, version of what george uh the lower doubts by maxim gorky which this Akira Kurosawa film, The Lower Doubts, is actually... You know, you fucked up Jean Renoir, so... <laughs> you're like... Rah, 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 rah. Jean Reno? I fucked up... I fucked Jean Reno. I love him. <laughs> oh, did you? He's, wow. My name is Vincent Ronan. I love that movie. Fucking Scan- love that movie. Fucking scandalous. You heard it here first, folks, on Hoover Busters. <laughs> I had sex with international acclaimed actor and the blood, five, the five blood star, Jean Reno. Yeah. Um... Did you watch the Five Bloods? No, I. I you oh, know, it's, it's great. It's on the you list. Watch it. Um, I think I think we leave it. I leave it there because I'm bored. I'm real oh, bored. It's uh, so boring. No, I am always bored talking to you, Leah. Yeah, oh, it's the worst. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, uh, we we did some solo episodes on the Patreon this Fuck month. Yeah. I talked about I talked about Brecht, which is classic. It's our version um, of Speaker Box. Where of, uh, what? of uh sorry the um the Outcast double album you did like speaker box I did the Love Below it's a double album remember oh, Outcast yeah I forgot about yeah. that I remember that record hey yeah, yeah hey yeah. yeah it's on the Love you Below you think you got it oh you think you, you got think it you got it um, shake it Liam shake it shake but, it like so a Polaroid I talked picture. about uh, Steven it, Soderbergh's film shut the fuck up Steven Soderbergh's film The Laundromat which is great another movie that like very much leans into the uh, theatrical devices in the cinema. Um, and George talked about Seberg starring Kristen 
You had my heart at hello, Stuart. You had my heart at hello. I love her. I just love her. I oh, love she's her. amazing. She my heart. She's, yeah, she's, great. she's great. Yeah. I celebrate all of her work except for the Twilight movies. Uh, Patreon.com slash Oovrabusters if you want to listen to those. Case three dollars a month gets season, you some additional content. Season seventeen on Uberbusters. I'm saying it right now. Case oh, hell yeah, <laughs> we could just do her movies with um, Olivia Assayas, yeah. who I once saw at a museum oh, here in LA. God, always fucking god. Yeah, we get it. And you I was live, like, I was, I said to Emily, I was like, that's Olivia Assayas. I was like, that's Olivia Assayas, the film director. And she was like, oh. no one else knows that that's who that is. <laughs> she Although was I, like, you're I, a loser. How'd you know? How'd you I, know that? I swear, I swear, and I'm not sure if it was him, but I'm gonna say that it was. PTA at the commissary near the Warner Brothers studio and I came home I was like hey Liam I think I saw PTA he's like you motherfucker you saw him before I did I was like damn straight I did it looked like him um moving on so next week next uh, next up on the show Hidden Fortress damn straight all things go well our buddy Randy Wilkins who's returning after doing our Joker episode and I'm excited to talk to Randy about Hidden Fortress because Randy and I bonded uh initially over Star Wars and Hidden uh, Fortress is the uh, inspiration for. I'm pretty sure Lucas cited the lower depths. Maxim Gorky's. <laughs> oh, the 1902 play. Maxim Gorky play, a yeah. hallmark of social realism. <laughs> you know that the there's film also a Chewbacca wa- in that one too. The in film the, we watched in today. The original lower depths. Shut the fuck. Up. Oh, the Where, film we watched today. A, a peasant walks out into the fields and he's like, "Ah, there is my Chewbacca." <laughs> That's, a, that's actually why Stalin, that's actually why Stalin had to be killed. <laughs> he was like, you will not have Chewbacca's. No, he knew that Max USSR. and Gorky had traveled from the future and found Peter Mayhew in the Chewbacca costume and brought him back. And like he knew that Max and Gorky was a time traveler. By the way, have you seen pictures of Max and Gorky? He definitely does look a bit like a Chewbacca. I'm, I'm looking at him right now. He's he looks in the, like Chewbacca. The Wikipedia open. No, he doesn't. You're fucking wrong. Hidden Fortress with Randy Wilkins, and then we're gonna follow it up with the bad sleep well Kurosawa's loose adaptation of hamlet which is based on the lower depths of 1902. <laughs> good god i could the, i could just see the very very little patreon money that we have coming in just like evaporating it's evaporate it's gone um we were on we were on citizen kane we were, on we citizen were in kane. citizen kane we played um, i played rose i played the, the slud <laughs> I I I, you, I played the dad. It was tragic. Um, we did an episode of all the the only podcast about movies with Shahir and Matt, uh, in which Matt had some hot takes about scorching. Citizen Kane scorching, and that's available on their feed. We'll include that in the notes. And then I was on uh, again. I made a, a rare, rare rare solo pod appearance on all the presidents' minutes. Our buddy Blake solo Howard's pod podcast, which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and then. Uh, yeah, that's a, please review. Re, can you re, can you fuck can you fucking review yeah. the show? God damn it, people! What the fuck? Can we get just off get your some, asses! What else stop. are you fucking? You don't even doing? have to get up. You just go to another. You stop watching porn and you, you go just, to another website. You just you just spend forty eight minutes listening to us fucking say over and over and over again, Maxim Gorky, Maxim. <laughs> <laughs> the lower depths, and you don't fucking have time to review our shitty podcast. What that is, is wrong with bullshit. you? Bullshit. That is bullshit. Bullshit. Right? Fucking bullshit. We gave you jokes was, about Chewbacca, about Stalinism. <laughs> Chewbacca, Maxim Gorky, the time traveler. Yeah. What else do you people fucking need from us? Actually, the thing that's crazy is that I was about to make the same Star Wars Maxim Gorky joke. We have to end this. We have to end it. <laughs> I right, forgot let's... that I made it. Uh, I was Liam Billingham. I was George Fagopoulos. This was... Uber Busters. <laughs> Busters. <laughs> nice. Nice call, Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, y'all. Love you.